The expression is such a fundamental right that is recognized, I think, in every country in the world, almost. Uh, it, it is so fundamental to our existence and ability to make positive, meaningful change. You do that by having access to information and having more ideas out into the public, not less, because essentially when there's less, it's really just uh, a perspective that's only going to benefit the elite and the ruling class and the establishment, not the public in general. Hi everyone. Before we get started, I have to plug a few quick things. First of all, my book, Brexit, The Establishment Civil War, is now available to order. You can read some chapter previews by following the link in the description below. Our sponsors, ExpressVPN, get 35% off 12 months of ExpressVPN, and get 25% off podcast hosting with Podium. Finally, if you're watching this on YouTube, please go check out odyssey.com instead. We are hosting all our videos there, if you're a creator, you can move your videos across with one simple click and you can earn cryptocurrency simply by watching videos and use it to tip your favorite creators like myself. So please check that all out if you want to support the show. Anyway, here's the podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today I am talking to Taylor Hudak, who is an independent journalist and writer at activism.org. Welcome to the show, Taylor. Yeah, thank you for having me. No problem. So do you want to start by giving people an idea of your of your background and, and uh, what activism.org is? Yeah, so I am an independent journalist. I'm based in the United States, but I work for an organization called Activism Munich. You can find our work at activism.org. That is acttvism.org. And we're also on YouTube under the name Activism Munich. And we're basically a European nonprofit independent news organization. And we cover free speech cases, free press cases, US foreign policy, environmental issues, the corruption of the intelligence agencies, and even some aspects of sociology and psychology. So we cover a wide range of topics that are left uncovered in the mainstream press, and we're completely independent and viewer funded, and we don't take any money from corporations. And that is, of course, what essentially allows us to be able to speak honestly about U.S. foreign policy and other controversial matters. Mm. And yeah, the independent funding is is incredibly crucial. And it's really sad these days that you have to be so careful about who is funding what like even even just in the names of what of of people so for example the 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 justice democrats in america they, they're all about being for you and 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 yet the young turks and the justice democrats are completely corporate funded um, so it's it's so difficult to navigate that minefield in in the 21st century unfortunately so what brought you to, to journalism and like, well, how did you find activism.org and why did you decide to work for them and, and not the New York Times? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I should also note that I also have work that can be found in The Last American Vagabond. We have been suspended from YouTube, but we did get the channel back. But uh, you could find all of that work at The Last American Vagabond. That is also another independent organization. So essentially, I actually had dreams of becoming a mainstream journalist. At the time that I wanted to get into journalism, I wasn't thinking of it in a sense of mainstream or corporate versus independent. I just decided to go to grad school. I studied English. I was always interested in politics. I liked writing, reading, and researching. So I decided to pursue uh, a graduate degree in journalism and media. And it was at around that time, about a year and a half in, or more so about a year into the program, I realized that so many of the issues I cared about, I would not be able to speak honestly about them or report honestly about them in the mainstream press. And I noticed that even at the very tiny place that I was working at at the time, uh, was starting to become a little bit more hostile to some of the content that I was interested in producing or the type of coverage I wanted to put out. So I started to realize slowly, maybe I should go an independent route. And I was terrified at first and very nervous because I didn't know what that really meant or what that would look like. And 
to be perfectly honest, there have been times where I thought to myself, my life would be so much easier if I would have went a main street route. But at the end of the day, those thoughts don't last too long because I know that this is the correct path. Independent media is where you can access the truth. And um, again, it goes down to the the funding factor. If you're funded by big corporations, you really can't hold them to account. So that is why I chose to become independent. And because of that, I have been able to speak exactly how I would like to on various topics and report factually as well. Mm. So what was the issue that that made you realize, or maybe it was a couple of issues, but what was the issue that made you realize that there were things that you couldn't cover even at that small outlet where you were working? Yeah. So I just got that sense. There's not one specific incident that I could really point to, but I just noticed that I was not going to be able to do what I wanted to do in a mainstream sphere. I would at least get a lot of pushback and it, it was just not going to work out for me. And also the educational institutions, while they're great, and I have learned a lot uh, throughout my time, they definitely uh, push you to become a mainstream uh, corporate journalist to basically rewrite press releases. And that's just not journalism. So uh, there wasn't really one incident. It was something that happened slowly over time. Hmm. What does journalism mean to you? Like, like, <laughs> in, in, like, I'm not trying to sound horrendously like <laughs> philosophical, but like what in your mind, what is like great journalism? Like, what does that mean? Yeah, great journalism is work that is feared by the establishment. It is work that is number one, true and factual. And is, I guess being a journalist to me is really about serving the public. My duty is to the public and it's not to necessarily influence people one way or another, but just to provide them with the information that they need to know to live a better life, I guess. Um, so they can make better, more informed uh, choices. Because right now, a lot of the information that people are getting is one-sided and it's not the full story oftentimes. It's just one accepted point of view. Mm -hmm. So I guess being a journalist in journalism is about also whistleblowing and it's about exposing corruption and power in the interest of the public. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're going to get on to free speech, but like, why is that dissent and that difference of of opinion and and outlook and and people coming at things from from many different angles? Like, why is why do you feel that's so important? Well, I think it goes back to a bigger idea of censorship, which which we are seeing uh, very much right now, both on social media and also on various platforms like YouTube. And because of that, we've seen other platforms arise from this censorship. And I just, I'm gonna go back to a quote that Julian Assange said, and he said that censorship reveals fear and it really does. So I think that it's important to have a wide range of uh, perspectives, not to get too much into COVID, I don't wanna do that, but one thing that is happening, I'm speaking with a lot of scientists and medical doctors who have a different perspective that's not being portrayed in the mainstream press. They're not even saying that they're 100% correct or sure of it. They're pretty sure, but they want to have a discussion with their colleagues who hold more mainstream views. And that's that's not even being allowed to happen right now. And that's not a good thing. There should be more information out there. I think the best solution is more speech, not less speech. I know everybody says that, but it's true. We need to have debates and discussions and people need to be challenged and that's not happening right now. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, the the lack of of willingness to have a discussion about the other side of an issue is something that it seems to constantly come up in in, in the modern day is, is really weird. I, I, because most of the time I, I feel like if, if you believe that someone doesn't understand the topic so say like hypothetically, I'm talking to someone and I'm like, well, you're wrong because you don't get it. My my natural instinct is to want to explain why I believe they are wrong or explain what I understand about it and and then have them, you know, either either disagree, point out some flaws, suggest that I might be wrong, but but at least that 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 dialogue takes place. And and it's something that I've noticed over the past few years is that dialogue and discussion i think that that julian assange quote is fantastic actually it's become like a discussion is is like a dangerous suggestion on some topics now for some people that's terrifying 
It is. Yeah. And what is happening too, is that these big tech CEOs and people in positions of power are trying to say that online speech or information could lead to real world harm. While that could be true in some very extreme and limited circumstances, they're applying this broad brush across uh, the board. And we're seeing censorship, as I said, so rampant just about everywhere. And um, again, it goes back to COVID too. It's just a great example of there being only one accepted narrative and viewpoint. Mm. Yeah. And I, when I get my real tinfoil hat on, I go, my, my head immediately goes, so why is that the thing that we can't discuss? And <laughs> I get myself in a lot of trouble when I, when I make, when I have thoughts like that. But why do you think that free expression and discussion is so crucial? And why do you think that that the realization that the, the the right to have free expression you don't have to agree with me but even just the the ability for for us to have you know opposing viewpoints and and still maintain respect for each other is sort of undervalued in in modern society i think it's a good question i think that it is undervalued and we're also living unfortunately in an era where everybody is so offended by the most minor things if you disagree with somebody that person is automatically a right-wing uh nazi or propagandist these ideas are just so drastic they're so black and white thinking and people that view things differently than us we can't just demonize them as having ridiculous beliefs while some beliefs are in my view ridiculous um when we're talking about just issues of left or right, we need to be able to have discussions. Expression is such a fundamental right that is recognized, I think, in every country in the world, almost. Uh, it, it is so fundamental to our existence and ability to make positive, meaningful change. You do that by having access to information and having more ideas out into the public, not less. Because essentially, when there's less, it's really just... Uh, a perspective that's only going to benefit the elite and the ruling class and the establishment, not the public in general. One of the things I've been kind of stunned by actually through this this last year is um, there seems to be this, I don't know, wall barrier. I don't know what you call it. So you'll if you say to someone, okay, do you believe that politicians are at least somewhat corrupt? And they'll go, yeah, obviously. And they'll be like, okay, great. Then you'll go, okay, do you think they would lie for personal benefit or the benefit of their donors? And someone will say, yeah, of course, they're corrupt. And you go, okay, would they lie about anything to do with COVID or the response in order to benefit themselves or their donors? And then it's just like, oh, no, 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 no. What, what has happened there? Why, 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 are we, why do people find it so difficult to be skeptical in this particular realm? Because what's happened is, is that they have made everybody feel as if they're responsible for another person's health. And while that is somewhat true, we've never applied this logic really in any other type of, um, with any other type of virus. So for example, during flu season, we're not telling every single person that every single person must be vaccinated in order for all of us to be safe. We're not saying that, but we're saying it right now, which is very strange. And so what's happening is, is that people are feeling like they are responsible for other people's deaths essentially. And to kind of speak out against that comes the media has painted people who do speak out as being cold, narcissistic, selfish, mm -hmm. um, and the list goes on. So there's been some demonization of people who think differently in the media. And then also to the doctors and scientists who are highly qualified professionals who have been providing their expert opinion that goes contrary to what's uh, being discussed in the mainstream, they're being smeared and silenced and uh, to discredit them. And in my view, based off of the work I've done, especially covering Julian Assange's case and Craig Murray's case is that the people I feel that we can trust, not all time, not all the time, but a lot of the time are the people who are actually being smeared and silenced versus the people who are being propped up by the establishment. Based off of my experience, little, little experience so far, but based off of that experience, that is my view at this point. So that, that brings us nicely then to, to Julian Assange, who, who I wanted to discuss with you. So 
let's let's go back actually then and and sort of lay out what, what happened to to Julian Assange and, and WikiLeaks. So he is, when did they when did they start actually? That's a really good question. Do you know? Well, this has been going on for about 10 years now, approaching 10 years. So he was he essentially sought asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy in London and he's been basically persecuted ever since then. In 2019, April 11th of 2019, he was uh, dragged out of the embassy and arrested by British police. Mm -hmm. And for the past year, uh, throughout 2020, there were extradition hearings. I covered those in London, um, broken up into two parts. And it, the judge miraculously, I, I still, I couldn't believe it when I heard her deny the request, but she did deny the United States extradition request. But Assange is still in Belmarsh prison right now because the high court is determining whether or not they're going to hear this case on appeal because the United States has appealed the judge's decision. And then this case is either going to be heard at the high court or if they do accept the appeal, if they do not accept the appeal, then Assange will be uh, set free and able to go home with his family. But again, uh, just to backtrack a little bit, uh, Julian Assange, of course, is the founder of WikiLeaks, an award-winning journalist who is facing 175 years in prison for his publishing in public interest reporting through WikiLeaks. And um, he is in London and there was extradition hearings that I mentioned and uh, it wasn't necessarily the trial. A lot of times people get confused and think that this was a trial. It wasn't. It was hearings to get him to the United States where he would then face a trial in the U.S. So far, that's not going to happen, but it could be overturned on appeal. Mm, I mean, I don't think it would be a trial in, in the way that we imagine no. it if we got to if he got to America. No. Um, I get the feeling that the Espionage Act would be employed and there were, yeah, I... I can't see it even being broadcast or I would say it'd be behind closed doors, unreported on, um, and then classified uh, very rapidly. Um, and mainly for, for someone who has, has spoken the truth and like they've never had to re retract a thing. That's the, I, I still, I still struggle to get people to realize the gravity of that. Like given how much they've reported on, given how much they've published, like the fact that they haven't retracted anything nothing have they lied about and these are the people that are being prosecuted <sighs> i know it's so ironic but you're exactly right wikileaks has a 100 percent accuracy rate in reporting it has never had to retract a statement ever and the journalism that julian assange has done through wikileaks has won him numerous journalism awards yet it is still that very journalism that has him in a uk prison today so while so so much of the time we hear about how China and Russia and Iran violate human rights. Let's talk about it happening in the West because it does happen and we're seeing it right before our eyes with the case of Julian Assange and also Craig Murray in Scotland. I mean, as far as I was aware, it was it was technically illegal for them to drag him out of the embassy in the way they did. Am I right there? Well, what happened was is that the Ecuadorian, um, well, let me backtrack. So he had asylum in citizenship in Ecuador because he was in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Mm -hmm. And that asylum and that citizenship was revoked. And then British police were invited into the embassy and arrested him. But you're correct. Uh, initially, when I saw the video, I thought, how could they just go into another? The British police cannot just go into mm. uh, the embassy of another country. That would be literally an act of war. But they were able to do so. They were invited in. And then, as I said, the citizenship and asylum was revoked. Mm -hmm. So it was a coordinated effort between the U.S., the U.K., and Ecuador. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people aren't going to be uh, spending that or using that much organization and resources in order to uh, lock up a man who is, you know, telling lies. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's, okay. that's, the, yeah, that's the biggest yeah. thing there. So why do you think that given the the sort of left wing propensity to to say they want to speak truth to power and they want to challenge corruption and tear down the system and someone comes along that that stands with all of those values speaks the truth exposes corruption and yet the left seem to have in 
not entirely. There's still a lot of um, sort of firebrand progressives fight in his corner, but like the there seems to be very little people who actually care about Julian Assange's case. Why do you think that is? Like, why is this not more significant? Like, I remember the outrage when when Jamal Khashoggi was was killed by by a, by the Saudi Arabian dictatorship, but when uh, two democracies uh, decide they're going to lock up a journalist for printing the truth. Um, there doesn't seem to be like proportionate outrage. Yeah, we're not seeing perhaps as much coverage in the mainstream press as we have with other cases and definitely not as much coverage as we would like. But over the past two years since his arrest, we've seen so much more support for Julian Assange and for WikiLeaks uh, since his arrest. And there have been people in the mainstream press who have covered his case and have said that charging him uh under the Espionage Act for his journalism is wrong. I've heard a few people speak out about it. Again, not as much as we would like, but it's we're not some fringe group of people who support Julian Assange. It's very mainstream in my view. If you take a step back and you look, every single major civil, civil liberties union in an organization, civil liberties organization in the world is supporting Julian Assange's release and for the United States to drop the charges all of them, just about all of them. So that's very significant. There have also been uh, several politicians and even world leaders who have called on the United States to drop the charges for Assange to be uh, set free and also compensated. And uh, another point here is that the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Niels Melzer, has uh, officially reported that Assange has been subjected to psychological torture. That's also very significant. And he wrote letters to the UK government to intervene because they're required to conduct an investigation. I still don't think they have after almost two years now, but um, the support for him has start, started out very grassroots, I will say, but it's we've seen it um, expand up until up into even people in positions of power. So we're not in a minority by any means. So that actually brings us quite nicely to social media because it feels to me like a lot of the support that you're talking about over the past two years or so for Julian Assange has come about online. There's definitely like a very vocal, dedicated group of people on on, on Twitter is where I've seen it at least anyway, and on Reddit to an extent that are very vocally in support of Julian Assange that, that keep beating the drum and saying we have to free this this man um and have been the people who have who have drummed up the level of support that that has has sort of um filtered through so given that i can imagine you're not a fan of 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 some of the the, the big platforms um we are on currently on youtube um who who are getting very censorship happy um anyone everyone who's listening actually should go to odyssey.com and the link is in the description below it's a, a blockchain based um new video hosting platform or fairly new um and i really really like it um and you can sync all your stuff over from your youtube channel immediately which is incredible um so they, they uh they've kind of yeah but social media is obviously not good at the minute in in how much they're censoring things and how much they're they're pushing down certain opinions and it's becoming more and more of sort of this homogenized echo chamber facebook twitter they're all suffering from the same sort of they've almost become too big um and and the attempts to regulate what what's on the platform is so difficult when it's at that size they've just gone for like blanket like let's just get rid of anything we don't like uh because it keeps people happier i guess so uh, how much do you think that we can thank these platforms for the ability to spread those sorts of messages so spread the message of censorship or well, any, any any of the things that we're talking about at the minute, censorship, freedom of speech, the case about Julian Assange, any of these issues that we've actually been able to raise because of, of social media, even though they're shutting things down, like, is there an extent to which we should be thankful to Mark Zuckerberg oh. and Jack Dorsey? I, I, it's hard for me to say, uh, but one thing is, is that social media is a very powerful tool with building social movements and to uh, raise awareness. Uh, that's for sure. I'm, I'm very active on Twitter. I am always trying to raise awareness about various issues. For the most part, I can. I don't doubt that probably the content I put out is 
probably suppressed, but yes, I, I could still post for the most part uh, content related to Julian Assange in COVID-19 to an extent, but um, I don't know if I could go as far as to thank them, but again, yeah, social media does keep us connected to some degree and I use it often. It's a good tool, but we really need to have platforms that aren't taking all of this control and just censoring people because they're not doing it in good faith. And, um, we need, that needs to change. So you have done some work covering, uh, Panquake, this, this new planned platform that is the most slandered company that has not yet released a product, I think ever. Uh, <laughs> so why don't you give us a, like a, a brief explanation of what, what Panquake is and what they're trying to do. So panquake.com is a new social media and short messaging service. We are still in the development phase right now, but I encourage everybody to go to panquake.com. That is P-A-N-Q-U-A-K-E.com. It is a social media, a subscription-based platform. And for just five bucks a month, you can have complete control of your online and social media experience. Uh, there will be no censorship besides illegal content, but that's not really censorship. There's gonna be no censorship of ideas. It's not a left or right platform. It is for everybody. And it is a place where people on independent media can also monetize their content. And they don't have to worry about their followers uh, being manipulated and their likes and retweets um, well, it won't be retweets, but that their <laughs> likes and any of their interactions on this platform will be interfered with. Uh, that's not going to happen. So it's a great platform if you are a content creator, an independent journalist, and just an average member of the public who wants to have good relationships online and through social media, because Twitter will just unfollow people from each other. And then people feel that, you know, something happened between their friendship and it causes real world harm. So that why, that's why it's so important that we stay out of these, um, stay out of people's online lives. So, uh, this is a platform that will save us all from big tech censorship. And I encourage everybody watching, go to panquick dot com and also follow us on twitter at pan underscore quake mm. i'll put the links for all that stuff in the description Thanks. below so people can yeah. find it real quick um it's funny that you use the word retweet like we're really gonna have to like like purge or mind or yeah, like, yeah. Like, seriously there's so many words like like i have i even like i still use the word google oh yeah i'll just google it even though i use duck duck go now i am still saying google it yeah like, I, I, I'll be talking about, oh, I'm going to make a YouTube video, even though the video isn't exclusively for YouTube or, uh, you know, Facebook me or like all of those things. We're going to have to like actually purge them from our mind when we start to move yeah. beyond the, like these these platforms, which I find amazing uh, that they've become like so ubiquitous in such a short space of time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing that I've been wondering about um, over the past couple, I don't know how long, after, after, over the past while, is that if, if this, this censorship continues, the first people and the people who have already left the major social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, etc., tend to be, now this isn't exclusive anymore, given that there's more and more progressives being, being um, censored, but it tends to be people on the right uh for whatever reason that is uh the ideological stance of some of these companies in silicon valley what is considered the acceptable overton window these days but for whatever reason it seems to be mainly people on the right and i have this concern that what it's gonna do is that all of the people on the right will leave social media pretty much and it will leave twitter and facebook as this monstrous echo chamber of the ideas of the left. And they will have no idea of what's going on on Panquake or Odyssey or or what are the other ones? Bubble. There's lots of different like new new minds, locals. Um that they will have no idea what's going on outside their little their little echo chamber. Like, do you think that the left will come along for the ride when we decide to abandon sort of more completely? places like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube? Or do you think they'll just be like, oh, thank goodness all the crazy people are gone? 
unfortunately, I think many of them are in the, uh, in the latter group where they are happy to see people that they disagree with, uh, purge from social media. Uh, but that will backfire eventually because one thing that people on the left, and I'm being very broad when I say the left, but, um, people who are cheering this on, uh, the censorship on have to realize that under a, because censorship is happening and it's not affecting people on the left, once the right is more so in power, um, censorship is going to happen to people on the left. There's nothing stopping that from happening. So that's something that they have to, to remember. And I think, again, it goes back to this culture of, I can't uh, be offended. I can't see anything that challenges my worldview. It's a really bad position to be in. And we don't grow from that. And we also don't grow from uh, cancel culture, which is something that is also very much celebrated by those on the left in my perspective. And of course the left is, as I said, very broad because I think that there are people who are more so on the progressive left who do not agree with that type of thinking. I have um, colleagues in independent media who are very progressive, but do not wanna see people on the right uh, removed from social media just because of their viewpoints. Unfortunately, there aren't many people like that, but it's just important that we realize that if censorship happens to a group of people on one side of the political spectrum, it can and it will happen to the other side as well. Mm. Yeah, well, well, it's been, this week, this year has been in a, been a wild ride this last year. I, I have found myself in this strange position that I do not know who I agree with anymore. Um, I was listening, I listened to the full three hours and 10 minutes of an interview with, uh, with a Joe Rogan, on a Joe Rogan podcast with Dave Smith, the comedian, who's like Mr. Libertarian. And I think like 95% of the stuff he said, I was like, yeah, you're right, Dave. And like, I'm meant to be like progressive left, like pretty, pretty far left on, on a lot of things. And yet here I am sitting agreeing with like, yeah, a libertarian, like an extreme libertarian. Uh, on on nearly everything which is really strange <laughs> but i hear you i think these labels just are meaningless at some point they just become meaningless and they change over time as well yeah yeah i, I yeah i think you're right so do you think we should be thankful for covid in a way in that that it seems to have yeah and I, I know you're laughing but i'm i always try and try and find some kind of positives that we can i can see that through. yeah <laughs> um can we thank covid uh i it's i know just you for everything it's like woken it's, it's woken so many people up and it it has given silicon valley the excuse to go in this like authoritarian censorship sort of mold that that people said they were doing before but it was a lot more subtle they've kind of lost their subtlety and therefore sort of woken a lot of people up to the way they're, they're operating. Should we, yeah. Should yeah. we be happy about uh, this? No, because I still think that the end goal, the threat of the government, not the threat of COVID-19 is a virus. And this is coming from not me, Taylor Hudak. This is coming from uh, scientists and medical doctors that I've spoken to the real, I think the threat of the reaction to COVID-19 is so unbelievably frightening and dangerous. We are headed down an extremely dark path to hear mainstream award-winning medical doctors who never had anything to do with politics and were never even entertaining any type of conspiracy or alternative ideas about medicine have said, we cannot think of any positive reason as to why they want to, for example, um, vaccinate healthy people with an experimental vaccine and they're not being honest about it. They're not being honest about it. It's so deceptive and manipulative. So I'm actually not thankful for it just because I think that what is to come can be so unbelievably dark. And um, I, while I think some people have maybe woken up, there's still a lot who are very fearful and that is the fault of the mainstream press as well. Uh, they did a study, I can't remember who was mentioning this, but the perspective by people, um, Democrats and Republicans in Congress, their perspective on COVID-19, like death rates was so dramatically uh, exaggerated. And to think that these people are creating policy uh, based off of this inflated, inflated sense of uh, a threat, I guess, 
is just frightening. So I, I'm not grateful for it. I'm actually very worried. And I, I'm speaking out about it now, not because I think it's something fun and uh, popular to do because it isn't. I'm doing it because I'm obligated to do that for my audience. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, the conspiracy theorists have really been right over the last year. I went, there was like a, a one week period where I, I was like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say depressed, but I was quite down and I spent, I just sort of sat around and I think I watched, I watched all three of like the three, four hour Alex Jones interviews, like the really big ones. And I was like, oh my God, this guy was right the whole time. I was it like, is kind of weird to see that happen. Yeah. <laughs> you then, know, I thought back last year um, in 2020, there were many people warning about vaccine passports and they were considered conspiracy theorists and crazy. And we are talking about that right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we just need to take a step back and and think critically about what's happening here. And none of it's good mm -hmm. through my perspective based off of what I know right now, of course that could change, but after all the research I've done so far, something is not quite right. Mm, we've the thing that I, that, that that I can't quite get my head around, and it happens to me as well, is is how th things that were said a month ago are just forgotten. Like mm -hmm. if, if so in the UK, for example, um, for six months, whilst I will want to point out the, the vaccine passport like proposal was out for tender with private companies, mm -hmm. the, the UK government spent six months saying, Boris Johnson, no, there will be no vaccine passports. Michael Gove, no, there will be no vaccine passports. The vaccines minister, no, there will be no vaccine passports. And then, oh, actually, no, no, we, we were just kidding. Like, that's totally a thing that we're considering. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't seem to, and it's happened on so many issues with like this. The, there was the two weeks to flatten the curve. Yeah. And, and, you know, people, you know, circumstances change and whatnot. But but still, we I, I think it's crucial to remember where we were at a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, and, and what was being said. So why do you think it's become so difficult to keep a grasp of that at the minute? I think because people are very fearful right now, generally speaking, I think the public is terrified of this virus and just putting blind faith into these uh, medical doctors and scientists who are uplifted by the establishment who are really, in my view, just politicians and PR people and uh, people. It's hard, I think, for people to come to terms with the fact that uh, there could be a very nefarious plan possibly behind all of this. I'm not saying that's the case, but based off of the number of inconsistencies and strange uh coincidences that have happened regarding COVID-19, its uh, origins, certain events that took place prior to uh, the virus being discussed in the mainstream press. I just find that there's something sinister going on, but people are afraid and that's why they're able to pass things or even have discussions about vaccine passports because people are so scared. Otherwise, I think we'd be very opposed to having all of our medical information on a cell phone that we have to present before a border officer every place we travel within the EU. I think that that idea were to be proposed two, three years ago, we would find it, well, I still find it terrible, but we would, uh, the public generally would view that as an overreach and um, inappropriate, but now it's, it seems like many people support it because of fear. Mm. Yeah. I mean, uh, Boris Johnson famously said that he would, I think, eat, eat, the, eat an ID card with his, with his cornflakes. Yeah. He uh, changed his, his yeah. mind. It seems like. Yeah. Do you think that, um, yeah, I'm going to finish up with something really wild and out there. So okay. <laughs> um, do you think that there's a there's this great theory called Strauss High Generational Theory. I'm just reading into it at the minute, and it basically suggests that like history runs in cycles of of four generations at a time. So you have like the basically it goes from like a, a period where you're renewing and rebuilding institutions, and then slowly through like the people growing more cynical of them, the the institutions becoming corrupt. Then you have some sort of collapse breakdown civil war something like that and then the institutions get renewed as society comes together again and like obviously it, you can't you can't like put a put a date or a or a time or a you know anything specific on something like that but i definitely like buy the idea that like human 
humans sort of general pattern is definitely in a way cyclical um i think we're like we we change like our personalities and our, our sort of feelings tend to change a little bit with the seasons so i can't see why why we that wouldn't happen on like a larger scale or a larger time frame uh do you think this is us heading towards some kind of collapse or some sort of like breakdown of the the institutions that have governed us for the past 80 years. Uh, yeah, I think that's quite possible. I think it's something that they, and when I say they, I'm talking about uh, the elites and people in positions of power have, are, are pushing for, and this isn't even a secret anymore because the Great Reset was discussed at the World Economic Forum. They talk about big plans uh, for the world that are, going to basically change our economic system. And um, I think we could be at that point right now. Their plans for us aren't, are frightening in my perspective. I don't like it. And um, it was once viewed as like a conspiracy theory, the great reset, it's not, they're talking about it. Um, and it just, that is what they want to do um, after this virus. And that is, perhaps what the end goal was this entire time uh, to create some sort of global medical tyranny. And I know that may sound a little bit uh, inflammatory, but that is what I think it is. And um, it possibly adopting a social credit score system with these vaccine passports, it's just, it's frightening. So I think there is an agenda to kind of basically reset the entire world and change our way of life. We're, we're already seeing that being kind of put into the, the public at this point. Yeah, I mean, I do get that impression. The the Great Reset was a strange one. Like the phrase was basically like disallowed on Facebook and Twitter and whatnot for a period of a few months until all the world leaders started using it. <laughs> and I was like, this is a joke. Like this has got to be a joke. If I said this three months, like just this statement, I'd have been, I'd have been like banned. Yeah, like, oh, it's fine. Like Justin Trudeau, and they can all stand up there and be like, build back better. Um, <laughs> Which is, <laughs> yeah it's madness but i like to also offer a positive uh viewpoint is that like this this coming out of covid uh, may have hopefully woken some people up and periods of great crisis and change can give us the opportunity to do magical and wonderful things like go and sign up for brand new social media platforms like panquick and odyssey <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh yeah Taylor, um, is there anything you want to plug before we finish up? Well, thank you so much for having me on here to discuss all of these issues. It's so important, something I'm very passionate about. I would just encourage everybody, please go head over to panquake.com and uh, get familiar with our website. Donate if you can, get signed up and um, follow us on Twitter as well at pan underscore Quake. We have delivery meetings every single month where we talk about our stats, the progress that we've made, the various new features about the build. So we keep the process uh, very transparent and open to the public so you can see the progress that we're making. So again, go to panquake.com and you can find my work um, at Activism Munich on YouTube, as well as the lastamericanvagabond.com. And I like to end off positive as well. So um, I share that need to do so. So I just encourage everybody to seek out um, alternative forms of media like this show, like Activism Munich, The Last American Vagabond, and share it with your friends and family. And um, I think we'll be a better world for that if we have access to more information and share it with others as well. That is a lovely message on which to finish up. So thanks, uh, thanks very much, Taylor. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, follow me on Twitter, or sign up to our mailing list. Thanks a lot to our sponsor, ExpressVPN, the number one most trusted VPN. Get lightning fast connectivity with servers in 160 locations across 94 countries. Keep your browsing privacy safe with ExpressVPN and get a 35% discount on 12 months of ExpressVPN when you follow the link in the description below. Don't forget my book is now out and available to order on Amazon and on bookshop.org. That's Brexit, the Establishment Civil War. And most importantly, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.